uh, his Twitter handle is redacted. Like, literally, that's what it is. It's redacted. It's not, like, blacked out. Redacted. <laughs> Welcome back to Redacted Media. We're bringing you the content as long as you mind your business. Before we get started, you guys go ahead and like and subscribe on YouTube if you're watching us through video. If you listen to us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, go ahead and like and review. I think you can review and like comment now on Spotify because they're probably yeah, yeah. slipping their game up. I'm really excited about that. Spotify is cool, but it also sucks. But it might be better than Apple. <laughs> Anyways, we're in a, a book three of the Dark Tower, the Wastelands. Right here, some some wild stuff. Yeah, and I I don't know. It jumps off really quick. Yeah, absolutely. Right into the action. I wanted to kind of like so we have Roland. The, the gunslinger, uh, the man in black played across the desert, and the gunslinger followed. That's the first book he's gonna get through there. He drops this kid named Jake into a, uh, a canyon, basically. He yes. dies, comes out of it, loses some digits, loses a toe, and then pulls three people from a door. Well, he tries to pull three, and the drawing of the three. It's kind of catching y'all up. And now we're here. He has two friends, Eddie Dean and Susanna Dean, not married beforehand, but they fell in love first sight. We love that aspect, right? <laughs> Romantic. <laughs> but so we're here at the Wastelands, and Roland is training uh, both Susanna and Eddie to be gunslingers, to be knights of his time. And we start off really just fresh with that. With uh, We start off with... It's been about like three or four months. Yeah, it, we have a little bit of a time jump, which I wouldn't expect here, because I think it's like six, another six years before this book came out, so he took yeah. a sweet-ass time. And... Uh, but in the book, Roland is training Susanna at the time, right? Starting with the rocks, that's the first mm-hmm. thing we see. What did you think about this little training session? Because it was, I love, it sounds like a, a montage, but like movie style, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so I really, I really liked like how they started there. I want to do a, I don't know why I highlighted that, sorry. So uh, first thing they mentioned, one of the first things they mentioned in the beginning of this book is that they have constellations in the sky called old star or south and old mother by north and so like that kind of gives us a weird thought of where this world is my original take through this is that it was just a different version of earth yeah it had it seemed like it had some kind of elements of it and roland is a human you know there seems to be uh technology hey jude is there you know yeah i didn't think of you necessarily like world bleed but we might have different stars in the night sky yeah, so like, not only does it take place on like a different reality, um, it probably takes place at a different location in that reality, like uh, somewhere else in space. Yeah, and that's that's we've, we've talked, talked about, about the uh, the the essence of size and like what that can play in this book and yeah. how how much that tripped me out at the end of the first book, and like that's entirely possible. And I never, you don't see much fiction dive into that aspect of like, no, this is. Star Wars, I guess, does, right? Yeah. It's supposedly the same universe as ours, I believe. Yeah, a, long a long time ago, ago in a galaxy, galaxy far, far away. Yeah. Same, same, same world, just, uh, you know, way over there. Just somewhere else. Yeah. <laughs> and somehow a long time ago, but they have lasers, but well, that's beside the point. <laughs> They're the ancients, and we just forgot about them. Maybe. <laughs> mm. Pyramids were, be- were built by Jedis? Is yeah. that a hot take? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> it's not humanly possible for them to lift those big stones. They, they had, had to use, use the force, force damn it. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh... <laughs> so, oh my gosh. Uh, Roland and Susanna are, are trained in here, right? And he kind of, uh... He goads her. In the oh, beginning, yeah. He's right? like, he's like, no, those aren't rocks. That's, uh... You know, that's Jack. That's the guy who pushed you. That's and he just lists off some like other bad people from her past. Yeah, and, the uh, the white dudes that like uh, were tra- she was trying to get to have sex with them in the back of their car. She said yeah. no, and kind of a is an asshole. <laughs> to kind her right of, off yeah. the bat. And I wanted to ask you, like, how would you feel about that little uh, exchange between Roland? Was that warranted or was he he in the wrong? Um, I felt like it didn't feel out of place. I feel like I've seen other like books and movies where someone was like training somebody else and they would use that same tactic of like, like piss them off to show them what they're capable of. Yeah. Um, it's never not a dick move, but like sometimes it's what you got to do. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I think that whenever we're dealing with someone like Roland, they're not going to consider 
what else has happened. They're going to consider outcomes. Right. You know, so the outcome was she shot five out of six targets. And I think grazed another one. Yeah. So. Yeah, she, she hit all five of them square on. And then the sixth one, she thought they missed. But then he looked closer at it and like she had grazed it. Mm-hmm. Rowan even says in here that pain was a tool after all. And sometimes it was the best tool. And I thought about just... He, it's cool that we get like these little insights into his training because he's not far off from how I pictured Court, right? Yeah. Who trained Roland. And the fact that he's like kind of good at it surprised me. I didn't – usually like you're not going to ask LeBron James to be a coach. Usually there's doers and there's coaches, right? Yeah. So like, you're not going to ask people that are very good at their craft to necessarily teach. Usually people that can understand or bridge the gap that are going to try to be the teachers, right? And – um. And Roland even surprises himself too. Like he, he notes in there, like he is, is surprised that he's a good teacher. Mm-hmm. Um, he definitely didn't expect it, but uh, you know, I think he even like thinks about like, oh, you know, if the world were normal. Maybe this is what I would be doing. Yeah, if, if the world hadn't moved on, maybe he wouldn't have been the last gunslinger. He would yeah. have been creating more. Yeah, which I guess he is still, but maybe that's his destiny. In a different sort of way. Maybe you know? that's the the. The future time skip after book seven is he, he, he starts reinventing the, the gunslingers. <laughs> <laughs> Bringing them up from the ashes, baby. Yeah. The did... next generation. <laughs> Dark Tower TNG. Dark Tower, A New Hope. <laughs> oh, my God. Someone like Luke finding a hooded Roland like he does Obi-Wan would be fucking amazing. <laughs> You see some kid like walking around with a gun and like she's on a mountainside and just walks up to this dude in a hood and he turns around and it's Roland's face. <laughs> yeah. You know of a guy that lost like three and fingers just... and a toe? Of course I know him. It's me. <laughs> then just grabs the gun and throws it off the cliff. Oh, it'd be, it'd be amazing. <laughs> oh, you're talking about, oh, you're yeah. talking about Ray Scott. Oh. <laughs> I was thinking Obi-Wan. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's funny. We did a we skipped past the little gunslinger creed here. Yeah, the gunslinger creed. That was that's probably the most important part of this chapter. Or it's pretty second. cool. It's pretty cool. Yeah. I really like it. It's a uh, it doesn't hold as much gravity or as much weight reading it as it did when I was in the audiobook. But Oh, re- I've been in the audiobook. It's, it's really amazing. Cool. It's really cool to hear them say that and even in the different voices of like Susanna or uh, Eddie saying it. It's a really cool thing to go through and just to like summarize it you don't aim with your hand you aim with your eye you don't shoot with your hand you shoot with your mind and you not kill with your gun you kill with your heart yeah pretty and, fucking uh, badass it was really cool <laughs> yeah. and uh and as they're talking and training they hear a tree collapse in the background mm-hmm. or like out in the forest and uh like oh what was that they said kind of close to our camp. They mentioned like, oh, they had heard some rustlings in the forest, but none of them were paying attention. I'm like, Roland, you're a gunslinger. Like, you can't not be paying attention. You're right. fucking up here. I I have to imagine like it was nothing as big as this. Like just mm-hmm. like like maybe you just thought the creature like the woodland creatures were more um, active than they normally would be. Yeah, for sure. But they they now heard a gun or a tree drop, and then they shortly after hear a second one, and it's getting closer. Yeah, and they realize, oh, that's towards camp. Yeah, they're like, oh. Eddie's by himself right now. Yeah. We better hurry. And so she like goes back or like starts wheeling forward and he's like, nah, nope, backpack time. Yeah. <laughs> and like, no, just, no wheeling. Get on my back. Let's roll. He just takes off. I think Susanna mentions in here it was like a little over a mile that he has to run with her on his back. Yeah. Him. Yeah, her on his back, yeah. That's a I don't know if you've ever like walked a long time with someone on your back, like on your shoulders. It's like an adult weight. I I haven't had anybody on my back like that in a long time, but even then, like walking across a room with someone on your back is not the easiest thing. No, it's a lot of weight. You know the uh, walking path down Ark City? Yeah, yeah. I've, I've walked that whole thing with someone on my shoulders before when I was like seventeen, just because we were stupid ass kids and they were light. I was like, "Yo, running a mile? That would be terrible." And that's that wouldn't even be on a path. That would just be like through a forest. Yeah, that would be a physical feat that uh, Roland is doing. He surprises at every turn. <laughs> and then uh, the next section, we we get into the head of the creature that is causing the trees to fall down. Mm-hmm. It's this gigantic demonic bear. So he's seventy feet tall. So, yes, yeah, so this is seventy feet tall. Yeah, and over eighteen hundred years old. Yeah, he like is kind of thinking about like the old ones, the people who used to live in this forest, and how like um, he would attack them, and they would try to fight them off like bow and arrows. Mm-hmm. And, those didn't hurt it because it was just too. 
you know, every once in a while they'd be annoying, but they mm-hmm. wouldn't like actually hurt. Yeah. He, yeah. uh, yeah, he, he did. Well, like it's funny because we find out later in the chapter that he is created by the great old ones. I imagine is a generation or a lifetime before the old ones. Yeah. So like whenever this world moved on, like did human civilization just kind of re- try to rebuild itself? And like, we went through, the same phases, you know, of like the hunter gatherer, then becoming more of a civilized, and then warring tribes, whatever it may be. That yeah, we're trying I to... think that probably did. I, um, I think that something happened and put us back at you know year zero. Yeah, I'm thinking that's about what happened too, and that maybe a a fear of technology had happened, or most cities became uninhabitable for a little bit, so we yeah. kind of retreated to the the wilderness or whatever it may be as, as like humans. And that makes you think, how fucking old are Roland's guns? So yeah. if Shardix 1800, and I'm thinking that's like peak civilization, let's say 200 years par- past our present point in, in our earth, you know, 2300 or 2200, where we could maybe have the capability to make a fucking cyborg. You know, it might happen in the next 20 years, but let's just say to be safe. An old gun from, I mean... That kind of gun, probably 1800s, late 1800s. So he's looking at a 400. It's like a 2,000, 2,500 year old gun. Yeah, that he's fucking using, which is crazy. If yeah. it, if it follows kind of our like same path. Of, yeah, that makes sense. Of of technology and growth. Um. Yeah. So this bear, you know, he's also in, like intelligent. You know, we we find out because like he would attack the settlements of the people who live there, mm-hmm. but he would like specifically target the the women and children. Um. To kind of like slow their, pro- I feel like to slow their progress or just like to piss them off, demoralize them too. Yeah, I believe yeah, it's like absolutely. we still have the men to fight, but there's nothing to go home to. Yeah, you know? <laughs> and um, he he states that he realized you know the party was there, like the, there there were people in his forest, and he just let them be for a little while because they weren't mm-hmm. causing many problems. Um, but we found out we find out that like parasites have infected this creature and they're like eating his brain. And so he's kind of losing it. And uh, now he's got this thought in his head that, like, because he didn't know about the parasites, um, really. He, he knows that there are worms, are, they're, they're, are worms every time he sneezes. Mm-hmm. But he doesn't know what they are. So he thinks that uh, these people have done something to poison him. Yeah. And so he's going to go show them what's up. Yeah, like, hey, motherfuckers. Yeah. Stop messing with me. How do you feel about King's attempt to go on the side, inside the, the point of view of an animal like this? Um, I thought it was really cool. I, uh, I liked it. Um, and you know, even before we find out, um, what we find out later, I just figured like, you know, this is more than an animal. He's like some ancient force of nature kind of thing. So I was like, oh, that's, that's really cool. Like to kind of get its perspective. Yeah. I don't know if this is around the time of Cujo, but you know, the story of Cujo, yeah. uh, St. Bernard gets rabies and traps two people in a car. Like half of that book is told through Cujo's point of view. That's awesome. Because he's he's rabid and he's like has all these like fever things going on. And I was like, you could see the same the same styles and things that he's trying to do here. And it was a uh, simplifying, like simplifying everything in the world to what you think that maybe a dog or a bear would think about it. It's it's pretty cool. Um, but we get back to Eddie, mm-hmm. and he is um, he's sitting there whittling on a piece of wood, and he starts thinking about. Uh, his relationship with Henry and how, you know, he, he used to like whittling when he was a kid, but every time he got good at something, Henry would just demoralize him. Um, he would actually beat him up a little bit. Um, even he would just talk shit until Eddie quit. Yeah. Um, and this happened with anything Eddie was good at, especially if he was better at it than Henry. Yeah. They even mentioned like basketball. Yeah. He was better at Henry than basketball. Uh, cause he was faster. Yeah. And it's another one of those, I don't know what King's home life was like, but his ability to like step into family problems and shit like that. Yeah. I fucking adore it. It's, it's, Eddie's obviously has some trauma that's going on in him that has fucked him up royally. Yeah. And like just the, how simple he can put it. It's, it's kind of cool to like, I think that somebody that has experienced trauma like that can put their problems right there on the table. Like, yeah, I know it's stupid, but that's, exactly how my brain works you know yeah. like i understand that i couldn't be better at henry because he was there for me but i am better than henry but i like i forced myself not to like all those like both sides of the coin you know yeah. like i know i'm doing wrong but i have to keep on doing this feels like a uh, 
it also might be like his his dealing with uh, addiction, just understanding like the human thought process. I don't know. I don't know what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> well, and and to even go off that point a little bit more, um, you know about Eddie's trauma. Um, he thinks to himself, you know, um, and he kind of feels awful for thinking this, but he's he realizes that like, oh, he can go grab that wooden whittle it because now he's kind of free. Yeah, he's gone. Like, I mean, Henry's gone. Yeah, and like, I was like, oh, that's that's got to be a rough realization because um, mm-hmm. like, he's like, oh, I love him. Now that he's gone, I'm free. I can be who I am, who I want to be. Yeah, for sure. Without having the the consequence of being looked down upon by someone that you admire. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it is a he's he's just a fun character, man. Yeah. He's so well written that like you can't help but not root for him. You. You can't help but root for him. There we go. That's yeah. like a triple negative there. <laughs> <laughs> There's no way you can't help but not. <laughs> so, like, I don't know. Just I, I want to try to appreciate the little things here that I, I like from the writing side. And I think we've done a good job on that the, the show so far. Yeah. Uh, but he, he wants to carve. And he's carving a, uh, was it a, a slingshot at first? Yeah, he's carving a slingshot out of this hunk of wood that he found. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's so into it. That he doesn't actually hear the trees falling. Mm-hmm. Um, what like kind of snaps him out of paying attention to it is like when he hears the gunshots, and um, and then he still doesn't realize anything's wrong because he just knows that they're out there practicing. Yeah, and uh, finally hears a tree fall when this guy is like right up on him. Yeah, like within the camp, I imagine. Yeah, so he uh, he quickly sees Roland's gun. He goes to grab it. He throws the knife into a tree. Um, and then he turns and looks at this thing. He's like, oh, this gun ain't going to do shit. Mm-hmm. And I can't outrun something that big. No. So he, he just goes and finds the biggest tree and he's like, <laughs> whoop. Just oh. climb right off that motherfucker. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and, oh, man. And uh, you know, he climbs up as high as he can. The, the bear like runs up to the tree and uh, at this point, like, Eddie's like, um, well, before before the bear runs up to a tree, he like starts sneezing and having like a sneezing fit. Mm-hmm. And Eddie sees all these worms shooting out of his nose whenever he sneezes. Um, and he he's climbing up the tree. The bear comes up to the tree and like he sneezes again, and just covers Eddie in like mucus and dead worms. And- yeah, I wanted to read that part. Uh, the bear is sneezing and then he he. He scrapes at Eddie, and Eddie says, Miss me, you hairy mother F, Eddie began. And then the bear, its head still cocked back to look at him, sneezed. Eddie was immediately drenched in hot snot that was filled with thousands of small white worms. They wriggled frantically on his shirt, his forearms, his throat, and face. Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> that, no, no, uh, snot grosses me out anyways. Yeah. A big, uh, with worms in it? Yeah, and like, like parasitic maggoty... Yeah. Worms. Oh. yeah. And uh, as he's climbing up the tree, like the bear swipes at him again. He's like, just started to get out of its um, range of like swiping, like it's mm-hmm. standing on his back legs. And holy shit, he climbed that tree real fast. That's what I'm saying. So I just like, thought about that just now. 70 foot tall. I imagine that's him standing upright. Right. And then when he reaches, his arms are going to be gigantic. So add like another, another 20 th- feet to that. 20, 30, least. easy. Yeah. 100 foot tall tree. That's up there. Yeah, and he, I mean, he did mention that it was like the biggest tree in the forest that they mm-hmm. had seen. Um, but not even just, I, I wasn't even like, oh man, that is a big tree. Like, I'm just realizing, Eddie's a champion. F- physical freak. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Crawling up that like that, yeah. <laughs> like, I was like, oh, that's, you should, you should enter some contests when you go back to New York, man. Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's uh, something that, yeah, I don't even, I don't, Wow. I haven't, I haven't climbed a tree in 20 years, probably. There's yeah. no way I'm getting up a 100-foot tree ever in my life. Dude, one time my cat got out, and he got up, like, 15 feet in the tree in our front yard mm-hmm. before, like, he realized, oh, shit, what am I doing? And he just started, like, yeah. and, like screaming help up me, there. <laughs> and I just tried to climb up 15 feet to, like, so I could grab him. Mm-hmm. I, I, I couldn't. Mm-hmm. I had to go get it, grab a ladder. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, uh, being a little kid, you don't realize like how little you weigh, how yeah. much easier it is just to do everything. <laughs> Cause like, Oh yeah. I used to climb trees all the time. Oh like, yeah. yeah. Like, and like anything like that, where it's like hoisting your body weight up. Now I'm like, 
humongous <laughs> and <laughs> I don't, I never developed those arm muscles to be able to like climb a tree, you know? Yeah. So, <laughs> um, and, uh, Roland and Susanna eventually arrive at the camp. Mm -hmm. Um, and as they get there, Roland starts having kind of a mental meltdown and he's not really paying attention. Yeah. That we get the first instance of what might be going on with him. We yeah. had a little like hint that he might be having a headache while he was training Susanna. Um, but eventually he snaps out of it and realizes this bear is, he says, one of the guardians. Mm -hmm. um, but then immediately after he thinks that, he starts wondering about Jake again and wondering if Jake ever existed. Yeah, he, the and boy I, existed. No, he didn't. It's like, Roland, hey, buddy. It got doesn't, doesn't fucking here. matter, all right? <laughs> Look what's happening right um, now. And so Roland tells Susanna that she needs to shoot the steel hat that the thing is wearing. Yeah. Um which Eddie had seen a little bit when he climbed into the tree. It looks like there's like a satellite dish growing out of its head. Mm -hmm. And um, so the, the copy of the book that I have has uh, like full page colored illustrations. If you guys want to see more of that, go ahead and join our Discord. Yeah, I posted a picture. It's yeah, great. It's really cool looking. Um, I, I haven't seen it because all I have is this and I usually do audiobooks. So um, I don't think I, I'm not, I'm sure the other cop or the other books that I have don't have that since every copy I have is like a different edition <laughs> like, sure. but uh this one had like a picture of the bear um swiping at eddie and like eddie in the tree kind of screaming and um i saw the the satellite dish in that i actually saw the picture before i got to that section mm -hmm. um and i figured it was just like something in the background i didn't realize it was growing out of the or that it was mm -hmm. like sticking out of its head yeah so when i got back i or when i reached that in my book i like went back and looked at it and i was like oh what the oh, fuck? What? It, yeah, oh. it's just it's just like a off a stem than like a satellite, right? Yeah. I didn't know if I pictured like a a box like implanted in somebody's fucking head. I don't know what I did. I, just, I can't get away from that image though. Now it's like if you guys play like Call of Duty, the UAVs are like a box with a satellite coming out of it, and that's what it just like shoved into his head. <laughs> yeah. I don't fucking no. It's just it's stupid, but I can't get away from that image. But yeah, there's something growing out of its head. Does a uh, Roland call it a thinking cap? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, he tells her to shoot that, and um, she is so big, and they're behind other stuff. She can't like get a shot at that right now. Mm -hmm. So she shoots it twice, like in the in the butt, basically, yeah. to get its attention, and it starts charging at them. And um, so she uh, she's getting ready to shoot, and it kind of like this little section happens in slow mo. Mm -hmm. Cause like she goes over that mantra again that they did at the training. Yeah. Um, and like her fear, like she just feels it evaporate and like, she's only left with like this cold determination. Mm -hmm. Um, and so she takes the shot and hits the dish and it just like erupts into blue flames. Yeah. And, um, the bear starts making like this weird sireny noise. Um, and like, it's stopped charging. It's just kind of like blindly, like wandering around in circles, like swiping at things. Yeah. Um, it's slowing down. Eddie um, feels safe enough to start climbing down. And we kind of get his perspective a little bit. He says, it sounds like a truck engine that's like started stripping its gears. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was a really excellent description to me. So I like, I could just absolutely just imagine like, the yeah, it's shutting down. That gives us also a hint that it's not just the satellite yeah. in this bear. This bear might have more things mechanic about it than, yeah. you know, uh, god damn, I can't even think of the word meat. But, yeah, uh, it's like... Um, biological. There we yeah. go. How about that? Yeah, there we go. <laughs> um, and it eventually collapses. Um, and it's like puking up the worms now. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, we get a little perspective from Susanna and she kind of thinks like, I never, or she says, I never want to have to do that again. Mm -hmm. But then she thinks, yeah, I do actually. Yeah. I can't wait to do that again. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and she doesn't like that feeling that she's like, wants to do it again. Cause like it did scare her. Yeah. Um, and she's confused by both not and wanting to do it again. I wonder like we, we, we have the same kind of instance later with Eddie in the book, but with Susanna, she, is kind of new as a yeah. person and figuring out what she does like and what she does not like. Yeah. With being split with Odetta and Detta, like, 
I don't know how much like King is trying to play on the fact that they're still there and like oh Detta doesn't like it but Detta really enjoyed it and like so she's still d- dealing with that duality of her personality but uh I think that's also a good thing to do with your heroes they shouldn't always be 100% on board yeah they shouldn't always be like oh yeah that was great let's do it again yeah there should be some inner conflict like there um one of the characters in Wheel of Time um uh, Perrin kind of his big his whole deal is like he doesn't like he you know he's one of like the um, the destined heroes, I can't remember what they call it, the uh, Taviran, which is basically like the Kotet where they're like being picked by destiny and like mm-hmm. destiny weaves its way around them. Okay. Um, he doesn't want that. He's like reluctant through the whole thing. He um, like whenever he's violent, he gets like scared of himself, of like the violence that he knows he's capable of. Mm-hmm. And he doesn't want to act because he doesn't want to become a violent person. And mm-hmm. so he's throughout the series, like he is like the reluctant hero because things keep happening to him. And so he's like, I have to go do the right thing. Damn it. I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's a, uh, it's always fun to kind of paint your character with that. Yeah. It wouldn't be fun if you had three people that love to kill. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and like he, he doesn't want to be important either. He wants to, uh, yeah. he, he wants to like go back to his small village and like, just be the blacksmith, like he. I don't know how much I like that trope. Like, like I just want to be a normal high schooler. Why do well, I have lightning powers? <laughs> well, and it's like, it's like he he eventually becomes almost like a king to a group of people. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, and he's like, he's like the whole time <laughs> fighting against it and just being like, no, I just I'm a blacksmith. That's what I am. Like, why why am I? Why are you people following me? <laughs> That's funny. Um, but so Susanna and, and Eddie are kind of reconnecting and talking with each other and Roland goes to look at the bear and he kind of is thinking to himself like, Oh, he never believed it was real. Um, he had heard stories about this thing. And, uh, but Elaine and Cuthbert always believed in it. Yeah. And he's like, but Cuthbert kind of believed in everything. Yeah. And, um, he, he likens it to the machines in book one, the, uh, the water pump and the weird machines in the mountain, mm-hmm. like the, um, the pumping, cart thing that yeah the cart thing and then i think yeah then the stuff that was under the mountain i yeah. think there's like tvs i think at one time there's like screens whatever yeah. yeah um and he wonders if the slow mutants that were in the mountains were like descendants of the people who used to live here um have to be right <laughs> have like, to be right so that, that's the that's the uh result he comes to i forget we're on the west side of the mountains i forget that there might be a whole mountain range to their east i'm trying yeah. to since there's like no real good map out there of in world or what we're looking for i'm trying to leave it in my mind i always forget there's a damn mountain range that came through yeah and where is that they don't ever mention it yeah. you know um but he goes up to the to the bear and he sees like these metal tags on its legs um and they say North Central Positronics LTD, Granite City, Northeast Corridor, Design 4, Guardian, Type slash Species Bear, Shardic. Subnuclear cells must not be replaced. The fuck is that? Is it Sleeping. raining? Oh, is it raining? Yeah. Oh, my bad. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering if she was going to come through my house. What the fuck is going on upstairs? No, I was I was sitting <laughs> at my house uh, taking my notes for this. And yeah. like I just started hearing it too. And it sounded like, like kind of like creaking stuff. And I was yeah. like... I opened the window and I was like, oh, it's raining out. It's it's sleeting outside. Yeah. So we have this plate in the man's leg that one gives us a name. His name is not Mir or the world beneath the world. His name is Shardik, which I have always thought was spelled with a CH. Yeah. I mean, gun to my head. I was like, oh, I know the bear's name is Shardik. I would have spelled it just like that. So that's another thing I learned with reading this book. But also, I kind of just found interesting while you were reading that. Granite City Northeast Corridor. The fuck is that? That's yeah. supposed to be like a providence of theirs. Well, and it being a corridor, like saying corridor, made me think of like, um, I've seen some towns in like sci-fi-ish type things that like, you know, take place kind of underground, like, like a vault from yeah. uh, Fallout for sure, or like a whole town. Yeah, and so maybe that's something like this is like. It was like this underground place, and this was like the northeast section of it. Hmm. Yeah, uh, that's a 
crazy thing. We do have another mentioning of North Central Positronics. Yeah. Which is, I think, like our third or fourth mention so far yeah. of this big company that did a lot of shit. It made a fucking a, a pumping <laughs> railway car. It yeah. made it made a bear. <laughs> you know, they're just all over the place. They're like GE or Disney. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Ed, Eddie and Susanna have come up, and they um, are talking about it being a robot. And uh, Roland grosses them out because he just goes up and like cuts out its eye. Does that that why is that gross them out? They've been killing lobsters for the last month, right? They had to have skinned some deer by now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess cutting out someone's eye is kind of. It's like why are you why are you doing that, buddy? It's dead. Yeah. What are you doing? Um, but then he tells them to come look, and like they look through the eye, and like in the back of its skull, they see like a motherboard to it. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think Roland knows what it is. He just knows it's machinery. Yeah. Um, but I think Eddie recognizes it as like a computer part. I definitely pictured like Terminator eye. Yeah. There's a red dot well, yeah. back there that was glowing. Yeah, that's how I pictured it. I don't know. Uh, so there's like there's some uh, some filament wires that were hanging out too that were connected to the eye, like also yeah. with the the tenons or whatever the hell you have connected yeah. to your eye, you know. Um, and then Roland's like, "Well, we're gonna have to move camp because this thing has wrecked what what we have of the camp, mm-hmm. and uh, it's probably gonna attract other creatures." Yeah. And as he moves to start doing that, he collapses. This man has fainted. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> like four times now. Like, get your life together. Yeah, right? <laughs> Why are you fainting so much? <laughs> I don't think I've ever fainted once in my life. Never have I ever fainted. And this man has fainted four times in probably the last year. I'm mean, at the most a year that this yeah. book has been going on. You know, what the fuck? He um, fainted it, Jake. He fainted on the beach like three times. <laughs> um, he's still he's still conscious right now. He's but he's on the ground like ranting about the boy. Um, he says Jake's famous quote. Mm-hmm. Um. And then he just, then he passes out. Yeah. Um, so we wake up later. Um, they've got him like gathered around a campfire. Um, and he's wrapped, he's got multiple animal skins, like deer skins wrapped around him. Even though it's warm as hell out, Eddie thinks like, he's like, how's he not, you know, cooking like a sauna in there. Mm-hmm. Um, and he isn't eating the other two arcs. It's, you know, supper time. Um, he's just cradling Walter's jawbone. Yeah. Um, and so Eddie, Eddie and Susanna um, are talking. They're like, okay, we, we need to make him talk. So they go up to him. Eddie sits her down on one side and he sits on the other. And um, like, okay, buddy, you need to start talking. Tell us what's going on. We, we noticed, we, we noticed before this, that there's something going on with you. And he's like, I don't even know where to, like, okay, start with the bear and then end with the jawbone. Yeah, there you go. That's yeah. so many to know. I mean, shit. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so he starts giving us kind of some lore to the world. Um, he starts talking about the great old ones or uh, people who lived millennia ago, like thousands and thousands of years ago. Um, they weren't gods, but they had knowledge near gods. Yeah. Um, they created multiple things um and one of the things that they cre- created were these were 12 guardians yeah uh, they were created to guard 12 portals which the great old ones also created yeah um and he says you know they're portals to other worlds um and he's like oh so kind of like the doors and roland thinks about it and he's like no i don't think so the doors were uh, like a seesaw with my call on one side and Walter's call on the other. Yeah. Um, they were specific to draw you out. Yeah. Uh, I don't think, I think these would bring us to different wares and different winds than any of us would even recognize. Yeah. I like that they choose to have Rowan mm-hmm. say the three best words you can have any character say. I don't know. Yeah. He's like, he's, he's like, uh, there's infinitely more than I that I don't know than I do or something yeah, like that. Like for every one thing I know, there's a hundred things I don't. Yeah, that's what he says. Yeah, and I love that. Just just let your characters be stupid for a little right. bit. Right. They don't have to give us everything right now. I thought that was a really good way of being like, uh, what's he? At? Yeah, like the doors we found on the beach. And Roland says, I don't know. Like maybe, but I don't think so. Yeah. So and he's like, well, take a good guess. And he's like, I don't like guessing. <laughs> I don't guess. What the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> um. And. So um, he says that the portals are, um, and then he draws kind of like a graph of them. There's 12 of the portals, and they're kind of, according to his graph, um, that he draws in the sand with the dirt, 
draws in the dirt with a stick. I don't know what the fuck I just said. I don't know either. You kind of um, lost me there for a second. <laughs> yeah. Um, but there, he draws 12 X's in a circle, like a clock, um, and says that he draws a line between each of them. So like a line from 12 to six, one mm-hmm. to seven, et cetera. Um, says they're all connected. And in the center where the lines all meet is where the 13th portal, the dark tower is. Mm-hmm. And so he thinks that if we can go to find the portal, we'll be able to find a, find a path to the dark tower. At least have a general direction. Yeah. You know, he even calls it the great portal. Yeah. The dark the great, tower. Yeah. And, Okay. Is this whole world one continent? As far as we know. <laughs> as as far like did you get did you have these uh drawings mm-hmm. in yours? Yeah. So it's basically just like a picture of a clock and then a whole bunch of lines through it, right? Yeah. But like Okay, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I'm getting like too bogged down in the, the what's going on in the like how does this exist without considering that it doesn't really fucking matter. <laughs> right. <laughs> but we find out that what the Dark Tower kind of is. We knew that it was a nexus of realities. We knew that yeah. was what it was. It was the linchpin that hold, held everything together. But now we have portals to different things that kind of run through it or are tethered to it. I don't know how to really put what the beams are. Right. I don't know if he says beams yet. He talks time. about beams near the end. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, that each one of these 12 portals all have a, a guardian. They just killed one of them, Shardik. Right. Um, and each of the guardians is a different animal. Mm-hmm. Um, he lists some of them. I don't think he says all 12. He says bear, of course, and then fish, the lion, the bat, and the turtle. That one was important. The turtle is one I really wanted to talk about because um, I don't know if it's the same turtle, but it really reminded me of the turtle from It. Um, just, I forgot you've read it. Yeah. That poem's in It. Is it? Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, that's my, maybe why it reminded me of that. Yeah. I think I believe that... Uh, it or or Pennywise does quote something about a see the turtle of enormous girth on his shell he holds the earth. That's awesome. So, yeah, um, yeah I, I wrote that down because I really liked it because it talks about how you know the turtle um, he sees the truth but can't ha- help or mm-hmm. he mayn't aid. Um, and he talks about like how the turtle is full of love mm-hmm. and um, that turtle in it like absolutely loves the children. He you know, wants to help them, but knows that he really can't. Yeah. Um, and uh, a lot of the things that they said about the turtle and just a little bit that they did mention him did make me think of it. And I was like, I don't, uh, you know, nothing in it ever makes me think that that one's a robot, but yeah. You know. Yeah. I didn't even think about like the robot robot side of it. I just knew that they're guardians. I just like the, the way that they, you know, always talked about that turtle is that it was like some kind of, great cosmic being um, i think that shardik might be our best duplication to protect a portal which i don't know this isn't spoilery so i believe that each this is actually i don't i don't even know if it's true i, I believe each one of these 12 are all 12 different realities these are gonna be different wares different winds maybe that's not. what i was thinking okay. too so like in the universe of the bear there might be a shardik real spiritual energy that exists and kind of governs Okay. That world, as Maturin, the turtle for it, does. Because he is kind of like God in it. Yeah, absolutely. So, and, and with Pennywise kind of being the devil. Like, yeah. that's that's their, their main struggle, you know. And uh, so, there might be a turtle guardian, but I think that these might be just their ideas. Like, if the great old ones went through the door and then somehow knew about this cosmic entity came back created something with that door just to be cute you know okay yeah <laughs> that's kind of how i how i feel it that like they're they're robotic uh, avatars like robotic or, yeah. like interpretations of something real yeah for sure i like that like yeah i like that it's like a physical recreation of something that to protect like the physical version while the actual spiritual version creates protects the spiritual world i can say yeah i like that yeah i like that that's cool. Um, yeah. and then Eddie starts thinking about like, well, this thing's not completely a robot because like it did bleed. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it had these weird maggot things eating it up. Um, then he, he he compares it to RoboCop. And he's like <laughs> he's like 
He's like, it must be some sort of cyborg, like Robocop. <laughs> I understand this movie probably just came out yeah, right. this time. What a great reference. That show was... <laughs> Fucking Robocop. <laughs> um, but yeah, they, uh, they're they like, okay, Roland's like, we can follow the trail that Shardik left when it came here. And uh, we can, you know, find the portal that it was guarding and use that to find the Dark Tower. Yeah. And um, so now that he's told about the Guardians, he's got to tell the rest of his story. About the jawbone. And, but, yep. So he starts talking about um, Jake. And he remembers rambling a lot about Jake when he was sick. Mm-hmm. Um, so much so that, like, he's, you know, he says Eddie told him, like, shut up or I'll gag you with that shirt. Mm-hmm. Like, stop talking about this kid. I'm sick and tired of it. Yeah. Eddie doesn't remember that at all. Which we... I'm gonna probably wait into the drawing whenever Eddie tries to like actually explain it to get to like mm-hmm. multi universe theory. Yeah. But yeah. So Roland has exact memories of things that have happened since Jake died. Yeah. But the people living in this world right now that they, we are reading about have no memories of that. Yeah. So yeah. Um and so he's going he's like, Okay, I think I understand what's happening to me. I'm going to tell you a story that is real and a story that isn't. Yeah. And I was like, okay, cool. Or um, isn't and should be. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And I, I love how he starts it with, I bought a mule in Price Town, and when I finally got to Toll, the last time before the desert, it was still fresh. <laughs> 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 not not as good as King's original start to the gunslinger, but I, I get it. It's like, okay, they're, he's really about to tell them just all the gunslinger. Yeah. So, like, it kind of just um, skips past it, but he tells them in detail about Toll. Um, he tells them mm. about going to meet uh, Brown and you know how Zoltan, Zoltan yeah. ate his uh, mule's eyes after it died. Yeah. Do you think on screen we could just put all the gunslinger in here? Mm. Maybe pieces of it. Maybe like nothing doing with his childhood. I think we could have flashes of it as like he told them yeah but like i think it would still be important to establish not be, jake and not I... be where this established or where this like introduces toll and jake i think that, okay. that still should happen first yeah i just i know that the drawing of the three i think is the best jumping off point if you want to tell the books in kind of chronological order yeah because just launching into the gunslinger you're gonna lose a lot of people i think yeah. it's so strange and if you're gonna be any way true to the book adaptation to adaptate adapt the book <laughs> then uh it's gonna be hard to win over not just fans or, or viewers but uh networks you know yeah i don't know how you could be like okay so here's our first season basically he's in the desert and some weird shit happens <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um so he then tells about how he came to the way station and found this boy named jake and uh like jake brought him water Mm-hmm. He's like, but I actually came to this way station. There was nobody there. I got water. I went to bed, and then I left the next morning. Yeah, and that's all I took. Mm-hmm. Then he goes back to tell like the Jake side of things, um, where he met this boy. He hypnotized him um, to like learn about his past. Uh, found out about how he died, and. Um, and talks about like you know going down to the cellar to get food, and uh, encountering the demon, mm-hmm. and uh, he talks about how the demon said, um, "Go slow past the drawers, gunslinger." And Susanna like starts at this, like she gets a little startled, and she you know recognizes the drawers. We kind of talked about it in the last book about how it's like a trashy rundown area it's mm-hmm. kind of like just slang for a trashy rundown area it wasn't mm-hmm. a physical place yeah um so the drawers can be really be anywhere is that the conversation we had about like hell in the original translation yeah. of the bible yeah <laughs> um, that's funny and so like she said there was also a mental place that Detta would go to to like basically reinvent herself mm-hmm. like after she would you know after she broke the plate after she would steal from places after she would fuck with the white boys um she would go to the drawers in her head um and roland gets this and he's like um 
thinking about like what the drawers would be in his world and kind of like lists some like seedier rundown places. Then he says, the drawers are places of desolation. The drawers are the wastelands. And I was just like, oh, they said it. They said the thing. They said it. (laughs) (laughs) I must be Superman 3, the quest for peace. (laughs) Wouldn't it be great if like, oh, now I must have the drawing of the three. (laughs) (laughs) Because he said gunslinger at least a million times in the first book. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, he, uh, and it's wastelands. Huh, there's a space in there. I've been writing it down as wastelands, like all together. Huh, that's my bad. I, I, <laughs> I believe I, that it. I, like, I it correct doesn't doesn't correct me. So wastelands yeah. is a word. Yeah, then, absolutely. Yeah. Um, honestly, every time I've read it, I've always just read it as one word too. I didn't mm-hmm. notice the space. Yeah, and when I wrote it down here, I put the space because that was what was in the book. But uh, sure. I didn't even realize that. Yeah. <laughs> so they uh. Yeah, they go through it. Wait, I'm sorry. Where are we at? Where are we at? Where are we at? Okay. Um, right at the end of section 14. Yeah. And Suzanne puts some more wood on the fire. Then we start talking about just the the Doc and Marty look of what happens with timelines. Is what it, what it really is, you know? But they join back. Yeah. They be like, um, there's there's two th- different things that happen, and they rejoin together. Yeah. So um, he Eddie draws like a, um, kind of like how Roland drew the circle earlier. Eddie takes the stick and he draws a line where two paths converge and then come back together. Mm -hmm. And he's like, so basically you have these two sections in your mind uh, where things don't add up. You just need to forget about them. You need to stop. Yeah. Just just section those off and forget about them. Yeah. Like that's not how it works, bud. No, it's not. No. Um, (laughs) um, And so he, um, Roland's like, well, but if the Jake memories were false, why did I take Walter's jawbone? Mm-hmm. Um, cause he, you know, threw out the original jawbone that he took from the demon cause it served his purpose. He and lost then, it like somewhere in the climb, right? Like he, he, he says in here that he got rid of it on purpose. Yeah. Okay. That um, might be just something that I don't remember from the first one, but I thought they just like looked down and it was gone. Yeah. So I don't, I don't really remember. I don't either. He gave it to Jake um, for a bit before the, uh, yeah, he, the speaking, no, not speaking, I mean the, the circle one, the succubus. Yeah, the um, invisible. Yeah, yeah. Smoke um, demon. Yeah. Smoke monster. <laughs> um, so <laughs> he, uh, but then he says, you know, after Walter died, he felt that he made a mistake in getting, getting rid of that first jawbone. So he took well, the skeleton from, or he took the jawbone from Walter's skeleton. Which immediately grosses out Eddie. <laughs> yeah, he's like, fucking cannibal? Like, yeah, what, what the fuck? Is this a human jawbone? <laughs> <laughs> fucking weirdo. Yeah. Um, and so he's like, why would I, you know, have kept this jawbone? Like, why would I have taken this one if what happened with uh, Jake wasn't real? Yeah. And Eddie's like, I don't know, maybe you just hallucinated it. Yeah. Like, like, no, I don't think I did. Which, in the Gunslinger's predicament, I could see him having hallucinations yeah. and... You know, some kind of madness brought on by the desert where yeah. I don't think that's an unreasonable thing to try to like, but his mind tearing itself apart yeah. is obviously something more than just like misremembering something. And one thing I, I noticed when I was first reading the scene, and it, it does get like fixed later, is like, you know, they end up thinking that he's like, you know, kind of crazy for having these two sets of memories because he never tells them about Jack. And like, 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 I, I would think that if Roland understood what was happening to him, he would understand or cause you know, he says specifically that I, I know it's happening. So you think that he would be like, okay, this is because I killed Jack and saved Jake. Yeah. Which he doesn't, I feel like that'd be like where you kind of start. Right. Like, okay. So there's this kid that died, but I stopped him from dying. So I now have two stories that happen. Right. You know? Um, but then as they're kind of bickering a little bit, well, just throws it in the, Throws yeah. the job out in the fire. Yeah. Um, and the fire just like <sighs> grows and we switched like, or we're in Eddie's point of view and he's just like staring at it and it gets like, it's like morphing and like glowing hot pink, like, like, uh, iron in a metal mm-hmm. or iron in a fire. And, uh, it like forms into the shape of a key, like mm-hmm. a very specific kind of weird key. And he's like, I need to remember this. I need to know what this, like, I need to remember the shape of this. Yeah. 
Um, and then after staring at it for a while, it morphs into the shape of a rose. Um, and then it just kind of, after it's a rose for a little while, it just poofs out. Mm -hmm. Um, and immediately, um, Eddie starts like drawing the key in the sand, in the dirt so that like it doesn't slip from his mind. Mm -hmm. And, um, it's like a, a key with like three, like big spikes, kind of like an inverted W. Mm -hmm. Um, and then there's like half, like a weird S tip, like curl at the end. Yeah. And, um, and in the books, I actually have a representation of it, and that's awesome. Yeah, like so we I've, have a little like listening to this, just listen to it. Like, what the fuck are you talk about? A little S shape, right? No, I had no idea what that meant. Like, there's a, a on the tip. Like, how would the fuck? Yeah, yeah. But um, in the book, we do get like a little drawing of what Eddie drew. Right before that, we had a right after the everything came up. Eddie saw a rose, and then afterwards, the rose he thought incoherently. First the key, then the rose. Behold, behold the opening of the way to the tower. Yeah, so I was like. The fuck does a rose mean? What's a rose got to do with this? I'm very intrigued. We we do get some allusions to the rose later. Yep. Um, but I'm excited to see like what exactly it has to do. For sure. I love uh, no, Roland's sorry. reasoning. Oh, sorry. Did you have I was just like now I'm like kind of thinking like you know roses have like you know like all the dozens of petals that kind of like curl mm, around each other and stuff yeah. and like. I was thinking, like, maybe each of those is, like, a, a world, and you have to, like, sift through them to get to the center, like, where the tower is. Mm -hmm. And I'm just kind of thinking, like, oh, okay, maybe that. But that that needs some more theorizing. For sure. <laughs> uh, I love that Roland's reason for throwing that in there is because he's like, because the voice told me to. Like, okay, yeah. first of all, relax. <laughs> <laughs> right. What else is going on here? You hearing voices? He's like, I heard the voice of my father, of all fathers. Yeah, <laughs> Any, anyways, you're hearing voices? <laughs> what else do we need to know, Mr. Deshane? Yeah, and um, <laughs> like, Susanna's just kind of pissed because like, it freaked her out. <laughs> yeah, the fuck was that? <laughs> right. Um, and so um, they just decide that, like, okay, it's, it's, it's bedtime. Yeah. Like, it's time to go to sleep. And Roland just kind of like very quickly like drops it and like wraps himself up in a deer skin and just is like, all right, peace. Yeah. Um, and then like he falls asleep. He's dreaming, but we don't really know what of. Um, and then we get Eddie's dreaming. Yeah. Um, Eddie is reading a book titled "There's No Way Back Home," mm -hmm. <laughs> which okay, of yeah, um, he, a little on the nose there, yeah. But. Because that's all he wants. I mean, Spider-Man movies have been doing this shit for a while. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so um, on the cover of the book, though, is like stamped a picture of a key, a picture of a rose, and a picture of a door. Yeah. Um, and as he's walking down the street, there's a bum asking for, you know, whatever. Eddie oh, we got to stop. Uh, so he tosses, the, the, he tosses the, the, the book to the bum. No, and the, the bells are. This book, the first line, the man in black fired across the desert and the gunslinger followed. Oh, shit, yeah. What the fuck? We have, like, what? What <laughs> What kind of meta is that to us? Right. Like, what the fuck are we supposed to think about that? That absolutely pulled me out of the story. I was like, there's a book with a line from my book. But it's in Eddie's dream. Like, is Eddie in our fucking world? Does the book The Gunslinger exist in his win? I mean, The Shining does. Exactly. So I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> you yeah. know, is Roland fiction in this world, but he exists? Yeah, like, what kind of, like, never-ending story shit are we getting into here? You know, are we going to dive into a painting? Is this Mario 64? Like, <laughs> what is going on? <laughs> now I'm just, like, imagining a comic where, like, someone from our world gets pulled into, like, a superhero world. But, yeah. Like, They've they've never heard or heard of or read of Spider Man, but now they're hanging out with them. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. 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 That guy. Yeah. He wears blue and red all the time. It's pretty cool. Pete. Yeah. He's a good guy. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Sorry. So <laughs> no, you're good. I forgot about that. Um. Yeah. The bum is Balazar. Yeah. And like, of course it was. Yeah. And Eddie's just like, eh, okay. I'm not surprised by that. Yeah. Um. He's sitting outside of a of a magic shop. Where, like, there's a uh, tower of cards in the window. Mm -hmm. a tower of tarot cards. Mm -hmm. With Kong on top. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
but he's he's making his way to a deli, and uh, he's about to go inside. And Jack Andalini is there. Yeah, but, oh, oh, big, tall, and ugly. With half of his face still chopped off from the uh, lobstrosities. That didn't happen by the lobstrosities, though. That happened by rolling, shooting his fucking. Gun. Oh yeah, yeah. They, he says chopped off by the lobstrosities. He, did. he does. That's not how it happened. No. I believe he he probably gets named even worse, but the yeah. original yeah. bad thing was his gun blowing up. Huh. That's that is weird. Yes. How do you pronounce this? Tom and whom? It's Tom and Jerry. It is right. Why? Why is it a G? Probably probably short for Gerald. Ah, uh, yeah, like that. yeah, yeah. That makes a lot of sense. And they're just like, like if it was a real thing, it'd be like, oh yeah, it's Tom and Gerald silly. Oh, actually, let's be let's be clever. Yeah, Tom and Jerry. Ha yeah. ha 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 ha. Yeah. Um. But yeah, it's Tom and Jerry's deli, and uh, Jack tells him like, "Ah, oh, go in." Well, the door's locked, and then uh, Jack goes, "Well, dad a chum, dad a cheek, not to worry. You've got the key." Yeah. And he looks down in his hand, and oh, the key is there. That's and right it's there. The weird key that he saw in the fire. God. The little S shape. That's the most important. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's the most the, important part. That's what he keeps saying to himself. So he enters the door, and he is suddenly standing in a field of roses. Of course. Um, and in the distance, he sees. The tower. He sees the dark tower. Yeah. Like, what? I mean, obviously it's a dream, but I thought it was a really cool, just like nugget of thing. That we haven't had any description of what this may be yet. Yeah. Because like Roland was like, oh yeah, whatever. I think we might have had the field of roses mentioned once. If and we that, did, I forgot about yeah, it. Yeah, it's fine. But it's like that there was it went up into the clouds almost. That there was a spiraling like window set, which is really cool. I'd never really picked up on that. Kind of picks more of like a lighthouse where there wasn't much windows and up top, yeah. maybe there's something going on. But it was cool to me to just have Eddie be here, and he was absolutely struck by like just how cool it was to finally be at the tower. Yeah, kind of felt like this might be his first free hit of heroin. Yeah, <laughs> you know, they, they they give you the first one for free because you'll be back. Yeah, like oh. He's experienced like what greatness this place. It's the fucking linchpin of all reality. It's like I can't imagine what kind of cool shit that would be like, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, he hears a horn sound, and like the sky starts filling with darkness, like coming from the tower. He does hear his horn sound, doesn't he? Mark something down. <laughs> <laughs> um, and like after like dark, the blackness like spreads across the sky. Um. A pair of like huge red inhuman eyes like is peering through the darkness at him and like glowing. Yeah. I was like, giant red eyes, a horn. Is this the the train from the cover of the book? <laughs> Ooh, okay. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, because I uh, doesn't that have glowing red eyes on it? Let's see. The little skull train? Very sure, much so. sure does. Very much does. Yeah. So there might be some kind of train defender. I don't know. Yeah, what would be like there? That's at the not dark even. What, that's not what I was thinking. But that's oh, even cooler. What were you thinking? I was just thinking like they were gonna have to like take the train to the dark tower or something. Oh, like that. I must be playing too much Elden Ring with those different bosses. <laughs> There'd be a train boss somewhere. If oh, they could. Dude, Final <laughs> Fantasy VI, you have to fight a train. No like, shit. Fight the ghost train. Okay. And like, what, <laughs> best thing about that is like, there's a character that you can have in your party who yeah. like, um, hit all of his moves and like special things are like grapples and stuff, mm -hmm. and you can suplex the train. You can suplex a train. Yeah. That's fucking awesome. I'll, I'll have to send you a clip of that sometime. Hell yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's amazing. Um, and people were really upset in like the new game, the new one that's coming yeah. out, like the remastering yeah. Final Fantasy VI. And uh, they showed a clip of that in like the little trailer, but the train didn't flip upside down, so it looked uh, wrong. Uh, um, and Square Enix like put out a thing being like, oh, sorry, that was a mistake. This is from an unfinished version of the game. You will be able to suplex the train. Don't worry about it. <laughs> That's awesome. They know their fan yep. base like that. Yep. I wrote down here that King can write the shit out of a dream sequence. Oh, yeah. I really enjoyed this. Just how strange, but like, since we're so familiar with Eddie's character, and at least this part of his life, it still kind of felt like our our dream, you know, that we knew about Jack and Lady and Balazar and the key and the Dark Tower and everything. It was it was really cool. I liked, uh, I liked it. I think it was kind of, kind of, kind of corny the way he pulled himself out of it. Like, it's always like you hear something in your dream that's happening in real life. Yeah. But, I mean, you know. It's a trope for a reason. For sure. It, it works really fucking well. Yeah. I've had it happen before. Where I've heard Absolutely. And it's like, that's what's happening. Like, what the fuck is going on? Yeah, there's been a lot of times where I've been in a dream and, like, 
I'll just start hearing my alarm. Yeah. And I'll be like looking around trying to find out what that noise what is. Like, oh shit, time to get up. I've never done the movie <laughs> thing where like someone was talking to me and their voice just like slowly becomes the alarm. No. <laughs> I don't think I've ever had that. It's always like I'm inside my own head, so it's happening from outside right. of my dream reality. You know, like it's breaking it's breaking through realities. That's yeah. how mine is too. Um but Eddie finally wakes up and he wakes up to like this loud noise. Mm-hmm. Um and he it's like a pre-recorded message uh, coming from the bear's body. Um, he asks Susanna about it and like, she's like, dude, you, it's been playing for about 15 minutes. Um, mm-hmm. We couldn't wake you. You were dead to the world. That's crazy. With how loud they say that this thing is, and that yeah. he was able to sleep through that. That's maybe not a dream. That might be more vision. Right. Type of shit, it's kind of last thing. It was a magic dream. Yeah, for sure. Something that needed a car dream. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, and also the fact that they just let him sleep, like, I feel like Roman would be like, push him in the face, like, no, it's time to go. Something's happening. <laughs> right. Um, the message that's coming from the bear is like, there is no danger. Repeat, there is no danger. <laughs> which I would never trust. No, you never. <laughs> yeah. Don't take these cells. They're worth nothing. Okay. They're worth something. <laughs> right. But it's dangerous. <laughs> um, but basically, it's like a message warning that the bear is going to shut down. Yeah. And it's like, uh, Call this number and you will be rewarded. Yeah, um, which I just found really funny because like they gave out like a, a phone number, one nine hundred forty four. Yeah, so I was like, it wouldn't work for us, but you know that's how phone numbers work in their world. Also, um, nineteen at the beginning of that. Oh shit! Oh shit! I told you I was gonna look for my nineteen <laughs> ones. You found all those threes, and it doesn't add up to nine. Th- nope, that'd be eighteen. That would be even better. Yeah. Oh god. Uh, the Shining room was like. 237 or something like that. I don't know. There's some way that they they did like a whole documentary on it, but like, oh, three times seven minus two. It's like, okay, that's a little too much. But <laughs> Yeah, numerology people are, are on one. You ever seen the movie 23? No, but I, I wanted to. Fucking insane. It looks so weird. It's so, it's so weird. Silly. And it's Jim Carrey just being fucking strung out. It's, it's kind of cool, but it's really stupid too. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Eddie looks like hell. Yeah. Um, and Roland was like, immediately suspicious like he's like you were dreaming something yeah dreaming something about? happened what, tell me and eddie didn't want to tell him for whatever reason um and he just, he's like nah this is my secret right now yeah and uh they bicker for a while and eventually like Susanna sh- yells at them to shut up and like stops them yeah i wonder like if i have a dream about somebody's whole purpose in life right i would tell them right that's just me though like oh i had a dream about your dark tower yeah. like we're here to assist you i had a dream about the main quest line <laughs> right <know>? like <laughs> Oh yeah, I had a dream about your destiny, but uh, that's for me. Yeah, right. yeah, it doesn't matter, you know, nothing. So there's gonna be some roses. <laughs> Watch out for a horn. <laughs> Keep it moving. <laughs> uh, and so the uh, the noise is driving them crazy. Mm-hmm. They decide it's time to just get out of here. Um, and time to go look for the portal. But they, because they walk to the bear first, right? Because they, they, they so. camped away from it. They walked back to the bear. And, like, I think they said that the bear had been, like, uh, torn apart a little bit by scavengers. Yeah. And they kept it moving through back where he came from. And so later on in the series, we go into the fact that Roland's bullets, his original bullets, not the ones he brought back from our world, have some sort of magical property where you can put them in your ears and it basically deafens everything. Why the fuck didn't he do this here? <laughs> Like, oh, we tore off a little piece of the shirt to put her. You know, that would not work. No, There's not, not a chance that that would help anything. Like, it would sound a little bit better, I guess. A little bit, but, but like, you're just taking off, like, the harshness of it. It's right. still going to be pounding into you like that. Like, what? Like maybe, yeah, our bullets wouldn't do the same, but you wouldn't know that yet. I so why not he, even try it? He never gets more fucking bullets, so they're in his pouch somewhere whenever they use it in book four. Yeah. It's there. They yeah. just... <laughs> um, yeah, they're, they're at the... Their camp, like gathering everything, because yeah. they didn't before they left um, for some reason. Well, yeah, I think it's because Roland collapsed, and they're probably just trying oh, to get away. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, and while they're you know gathering all their stuff, Eddie kind of reminisces about like some metal concerts that he went to, and how like oh this is even louder than this. Yeah, like Megadeth might have been a little bit louder, <laughs> yeah. but not much. Yeah. <laughs> um, and. They're getting ready to leave, and he's like, this is where the quest for Roland's Dark Tower really begins, at least for us. Yeah. And uh, 
they've left for a little while. They get to like a slope that's that's too steep for the wheelchair, so they have to carry her. Mm-hmm. Um, this is the first time she's ever like complained about being crippled. She's like, I I hate this. And there is some kind sometimes where I kind of do forget that she has right. limited mobility. But I could imagine being in this fucking forest. Yeah. God, let's get to a highway. Right. <laughs> you know, like, oh my god, what a this, the only worst place would be a mountain. That's the yeah. only worst place. That? Maybe the uh, a, a loose a loose sand beach like we had talked about in the yeah, second book. Yeah, but like something just absolutely rocky and mm-hmm. uneven. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and she offers Eddie her gun because she can't really use it while she's being a backpack. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's like, no, I, st- I'll st- I still think you're, you'd be the better one with it right now. Are they hugging? Are they spooning on the back? Or are they like, like backpacky? Like are they looking the same way or not in your mind? I figured it was more backpack yeah. Like, like they're like looking different different ways. Oh no, no, no. Like oh, okay. yeah, like like she probably had her arms around her, his neck like a uh, piggyback ride. Okay, yeah. That yeah, that's the better way to look at it was yeah. piggyback ride. Okay. I didn't know cuz you said something about it. I was like, "Wait, am I looking at this wrong? Are they looking no. different directions?" No, that would be that would be funny. Um <laughs> but as they're walking, the bear stops his countdown early. Yeah. It doesn't finish. Um, and I was like, you know, a couple thousand years, your clock might get off by seven minutes. It's right. All right. He's like, now it's past the last of the 12 guardians for all we know. I was like, yeah, I doubt it. Wait, the last of the 12? He says that? I think so. No shit. He's for all we know. That's okay. what he says. Yeah. And I was like, yeah. Okay. So that means they're going to fight other ones eventually. Okay. Or encounter them. Yeah. Huh. I, I never, never, never got that. Cool. Cause I was like, okay. When you say that there's no more monsters, there's more, there's monsters. always more monsters. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, and now they're going through a swamp, so they have to take her out of the chair again. Um, and eventually, after going through the swamp for a while, she uh, they, they stop for a meal, and she kind of asks him about his conflicting memories. Mm-hmm. And he he's like, it's a paradox, I think. I think that both are real. What a word for we're all in to know. Right. A paradox. Before that, I wanted to, before we jump in, I'm going to remember that real quick, but... Uh, Eddie says, Roland, Eagle Scout of Oz. Yeah. And Roland's like, what the fuck is Oz? You know? Yeah. And I found it so funny that Susanna knew it because of the movie. Yeah. And Eddie knows the whole fucking history. Like, he he read all the books. Yeah. <laughs> like, he was that interested in Oz. I haven't read anything else besides I've seen The Wizard of Oz. I've never read it. You yeah, know? same here. I've, I've wanted to because I've heard that, like, I've heard some things about the series, like, how it gets kind of even wilder. Mm-hmm. But, like, I've, aside from watching that movie and then the, uh, the movie with uh, Margaret Jackson. The Wiz is great. <laughs> no, oh no, not that. Um, the like the prequel movie that they made about the Wizard. I can't remember what it's called. Um, oh yeah, I remember that came out. We're like in high school, right? After probably yeah, yeah, around then. Okay. Um, I can't even think of who it starred, but I didn't see that. Okay, it was whatever. Yeah. What a weird movie to kind of like be so big like we they made that they did a great job with it for yeah. the time you know but it was what a strange fucking movie yeah <laughs> you know, flying monkeys and a house lands on a person <laughs> it's just <laughs> fucking bat shit crazy but so we have a paradox right which roland somehow knows the yeah word paradox. Um, and so yeah he thinks that both realities are true and are the real one mm-hmm. um and this is when he decides to like tell them about jack mm-hmm. um jack pushed jake but I kind of stopped the pushing mm-hmm. and he, he says that like, he t- kind of talks about how Walter was there and he originally thought Walter was the one who pushed him. Mm-hmm. And so now he's just trying to figure out how Walter fits into the whole Jake situation. Yeah. He even says that this was not the same day that Jake got pushed. Yeah. He does realize that um, he realized that in the last book too. Cause like he looked around as Jack and didn't yeah. see Walter anywhere. Yeah. Um, but even if that's true, like, um, by killing Jack, you know, he stopped it. I believe that Walter was, his call was inside Mort whenever he pushed him. That makes sense. That's, That's kind of what, what I was thinking. What I was that, you know, at the, well, well, at this point it was going to be like, Oh yeah, roll on your, you can, you're not even going to save him. You're just going to be here. And you're going to kill your host or take him out of this world. Either way, you're creating this paradox. Yeah. You know? And I, I guess I hadn't really ever thought about that. I thought this was the day and that, the characters were just wrong. I know he did save Jake on that day and that Jake was, it was all lining up, you know, beautifully. Yeah. But if it was a different day, that's, that's cool too. Yeah. Um, 
But now, and then Roland kind of starts to worry about like how this might be affecting Jake, like being alive in one world and dead in another. Mm-hmm. Um, and like, if wonders if he knows about it, mm-hmm. like if he has knowledge of having died. Yeah. Which like, whew, just imagine. Jake has got nothing good so far. <laughs> right. <laughs> and King's like, oh, he's kind of back in the story. Punch him in the face. <laughs> Oh, yeah, you're doing great. You're still alive. Now you're insane. What's up? <laughs> and then that night, Roland is having nightmares. And uh, we're in Eddie's perspective. And Eddie is just also kind of thinking about, like, what it would be like to remember your own death. Yeah. Um, and so now we've had, you know, two people thinking about it, which makes me think that, like, you know, this section is titled after Jake. Yeah. So what a, what a terrible choice. What a terrible choice by King. you got to be able to hide your shit a little bit better than that. Right. You can't name the first book Jake. Yeah. You can't do that. Like, ah, it pissed me off. <laughs> yeah, I remember after recording last time, we were talking about, like, oh, how, how you know, how, how far, far are we going to read? And I looked down, and I saw book one, Jake. Fuck! Yeah. <laughs> I'm mad about it. Um, but as they're, they're getting closer, um, they um, leave Suzanne at their camp, and uh, they're, the two of them are going to go scout. Um, they get to an area that has like a lot of torn down trees and vegetation figured the bear probably did that for like line of sight. Mm-hmm. And then, um, they're getting closer and Eddie realizes that he has been hearing machinery for a while now, but just didn't realize it. Mm-hmm. This is like the low hum of a machine yep. going on in the background. And, um, as they get closer, he's hearing it better. Uh, there's a low deep hum of machinery and then like lighter squeaks and stuff in the air. Yeah. And, they find they eventually find the clearing that the bear lived in um and they find in that clearing there's just this giant they describe it as like a nine foot tall metal box with a rounded roof mm-hmm. might have um, a subway entrance i think it's yeah like, it reminded yeah, me of a subway entrance yeah and uh has signs on it that kind of look like uh radioactive stickers like the like the warning sign for radioactive stuff hmm. they like Talk about them being like alternating yellow and black. I thought it was just like red and black or what yellow and black, like stripes, like yeah. construction kind of. I don't know what that. Uh, it made me think of like okay. radioactive. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, they talk about like nuclear batteries and stuff. For sure. Yeah. Um, but, that we have the things that are moving in the dirt, squeaking, chittering noises. Four, no five of them. <laughs> I love these little things. I don't yeah. know why, but I had the same connection to them as Eddie did. We have like a snake, a Tonka truck, a. Uh, was it an owl? Was one of them too? Um, I don't remember. One um, of them was like a little rat. Yeah, one was a rat, and there's a box in the back that had like little legs, little stubby legs. Yeah. Like. <laughs> they're just like little robot animals. Yeah, like, and they're going in the same path. And like they said, it was they're walking so much that they're wearing you know the dirt thin because they've been walking in the same circle for. And speaking of the dirt, um, it's like this gray soil that yeah. uh, Eddie realizes is like, oh, this isn't dirt. This is like worn down, ground down bone. Yeah. Kind of crazy. That yeah. is, Shardik obviously eats. Yeah. Finding that out. You know, he does like sustain himself, even though he might be a cyborg or he is a cyborg. Um, and, you know, they're kind of feeling like, oh, this is sad. Like these are just like, you know, now they don't even have like their, their master anymore. Yeah. And as they're watching these little creatures, um, they notice that there's dozens more on the ground, but only these ones are like active. The mm-hmm. other ones are like just lying there. Maybe dead or on depowered. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Susanna shows back up. She was like, hey, you motherfuckers. Yeah. I didn't want to be left there. Yeah, what the fuck? Why'd y'all leave me? I can yeah. crawl. Yeah. <laughs> um, and Roland tells Eddie to shoot the little creatures and put them out of their misery. Yeah. Um, and he didn't want to at first because he's like, no, they're just little guys. Yeah. Um, and he feels bad for them. And uh, but then he says like the mantra to himself and his like with Susanna's fear earlier, his pity melts away. Right and he's away. only left with cold determination. Yeah. Walks out of the clear out into the clearing too, like reveals himself to do yeah. it, which was again, would be great on screen. I mean, yeah. just this, this, his first time really doing the gunslinger creed and coming out and just emerging from something would be really cool to see. And, uh, he shoots four of the five of them. Yep. And then the rat starts like charging at him. Yeah. And, uh, this kind of snaps him out of the, of the coldness. And like, he, kind of yells for Roland to like shoot it and Roland just arms crossed 
I'm okay. watching it. Yeah. No, no. What are you going to do? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so then he does shoot it. And um, then Roland like comes over and starts yelling. Or Eddie comes over and starts yelling at Roland. And um, he is like, you know, like, you know, what the hell's wrong with you? And uh, Roland is just kind of like staring up into the sky. And he's like, down. And Eddie just immediately drops it and like falls to the ground. What a g- great guy, Eddie, then. Yeah. Like, he still has that much respect. Like, he says, down, yep. y- you're gone. Like, okay, yeah, bet. <laughs> you're trying to save my life. Cool. Yeah. And then uh, Roland, like, in the blink of an eye, pulls his gun and shoots a uh, mechanical bat out of the sky that yeah. was rushing towards him as well. Yeah. And uh, Eddie's like, oh, damn, he's, he's a He's realizing again how much of a badass Roland is. Yeah, he says, he can't be that fast. No one can be that fast. I'm not bad, but Susanna makes me look slow, and he makes Susanna look like a turtle trying to walk uphill on a piece of glass. <laughs> and he says something about, like, how, like, oh, he could have had it. He could have ate a cheeseburger and a shake before he shot. Like, he had enough time. Yeah, he was just. So fast. Yeah, and so Roland is a badass, where Eddie might be good in ways and like a natural gunslinger but he's not he's not rolling right i like that they're still kind of separating those tiers between them that Susanna does have that ability i believe that she says like the whole creed and draws and hip fires those like six rocks in the clearing yeah so she has the ability to kind of shoot from the hip yeah as it were um and so eddie kind of like apologizes mm-hmm. and everyone's like no you know sometimes gunslingers need to bite the hands that feeds them mm-hmm. and uh which I just found funny because, you know, you're not supposed to do that. You're not supposed to. But uh, but I get, I guarantee you, he, they have so many, like, comparisons to David the Hawk in here. It happens all the time. Or gunslingers or hawks, whatever. I guarantee you, Hawk, David fucked up Roland's hand a couple times. Yeah. You know? So, <clears throat> I think he's taking the same approach here. Like, no, like, you can get mad at me, but as long as we're still moving towards the same goal. Yeah. Cool. Like, yeah, it's okay to fight back sometimes. Yep. And, uh... But then, you know, he's like, well, what if I don't want to be a gunslinger, Roland? And he's like, what you want doesn't really much matter. <laughs> yeah, I don't have time to think about once. <laughs> what, what's what we're doing. You're a gunslinger. <laughs> and uh, so Eddie's a little bit steamed from that. And mm-hmm. he's like, he's like, okay, I want to go back and get her wheelchair. Um, he just really, he just wants some time alone to like think. Um, and after he gets away from it, like he realizes like he's shaky. He's like, um, but it's not because of the fear of being attacked. It's from adrenaline. Yeah. And he's like, I know I just yelled at him that I don't want to be a gunslinger. But fuck, I kind of do. I think this is a big step of Eddie, like, not necessarily trusting Roland because he does trust him, but desiring to be like him. Yeah. To, to take up that mantle of gunslinger. And if, say, Roland were to fall, like, I have no doubt in my mind Eddie would keep going. Yeah. And, like, this, um, you know, mirrors the scene with uh, Susanna earlier where she has the same thing where she, like, kind of yells at him about not wanting to be a gunslinger but then to herself it's like I definitely want to hell yeah what time um, do you have so I have an idea I have 425 okay no problem um but then you know okay so he's he's walking and realizes like you know if a door to New York were to show up in front of me right now I don't think I'd take it it's crazy um not until I see this tower at least yeah that 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 first hit he had in his dream yeah like Oh yeah, it's worth it. It's yeah. it's worth risking my life and maybe never having a chance back in my New York. Yeah, that's why his wife is here. I mean, like, there's some reasons yeah. for him to stay in the, yeah, this like, win. You know, he's like, this is kind of who I want to be, which is cool. Yeah, I mean, uh, and Eddie didn't have much going for him in New York. I mean, Honestly. he's an addict. His brother is now dead. I I got to imagine his mom is dead. Yeah, around. I mean, or not in his life anymore. Never mentioned his dad. Uh, not once. Yeah, didn't have a girlfriend or nothing. So. Yeah. Good for Eddie. Good. I'm glad that he feels at home because that's. He, I don't necessarily think he ever knew himself in Earth. Yeah. On Earth, you know, he didn't know what to do. He was living in the shadow of Henry and like doing everything to please him. So he never really had much individuality to him. Even never like Henry came back to from yeah. from war. I thought about that time like Eddie had just graduated high school. So. You know, I, I was kind of thinking like, yeah, Eddie's already an adult. He's like 21, I think, is what I said earlier. Was it? Um, no, he's not 21, is he? I thought that's what it said. I thought he was like, really? I think we I actually was giving him like 26. That. I think we even talked about being think, surprised by how young he God, was. Yeah, because uh, Susanna's 29. I remember that. Yeah. God damn. And um, 
Yeah, uh, he's, he's, a, so, he's a kid. <laughs> yeah, so even though he's like technically already an adult, this is also kind of like a coming of age or coming of self to him. For sure. Um, I think you'd have a, a coming age story around 21. Yeah. I don't think that's too I, I mean, I, like stereotypically. Yeah, like, yeah it's, it's not it's not the body. Or yeah. the stand, people, stand by me. <laughs> yeah. Um, but so we skip to him coming back to the chair and he's kind of thinking that like um, the humming is either coming from the box or underneath it. Um, and they ask Roland like, where do you think this portal goes? He's like, maybe nowhere, maybe everywhere. I don't know. Well, doesn't matter to me. Not to the Dark Tower. I know yep. that much. That's in the exact opposite direction, boys. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, and then he starts talking to them about how uh, this is where we kind of get the info dump. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, he, he starts talking about how the world has moved on and mm-hmm. like it's not just a saying. It's mm-hmm. like the world is expanding. The world is like becoming unstable. The... Uh, the portal is where one of the beams start. And he says that the beams were these things created by the great old ones. They're lines that bind and hold things together. Mm -hmm. Um, They are basically like what holds the universe in place. Yeah. And they're weakening. Um, But if we follow the, the, the beams, we'll reach the tower. Yeah. And so he doesn't say it, but it kind of made me think like, okay, so maybe the reason that he's trying to find the tower is so that he can fix whatever is going wrong um, and trying to save the universe from imploding. Yeah, I guess you really haven't been given a reason why Roland wants to see this fucking Dark Tower. No, we you? still haven't. Okay, yeah, I'm sorry. That's so ingrained in my just right. past rereads. Like, I understand why he wants so, to get there. So it's like yeah. part of the mystery still is sure. trying to figure out why he wants to get to the Tower. Yeah, tower. okay. Um, and so, you know, this is maybe the first hint that we have that, like, you know, oh, it's a hero's quest to save the world. Yeah. I do like... Um, uh, that whenever Roland is telling him about that, Eddie like Eddie pops off as he usually does. He says, "Well, you have to allow time to stop to write postcards and drink beer," and then says, "But they both ignored him." <laughs> I love that both Susanna and Roland are like, "Shut up!" <laughs> yeah, <laughs> your little quips are getting annoying already. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and he also like kind of pops off like, "Worlds don't grow. Like mm-hmm. the world isn't. What are you talking about?" And he's like, "It does. It is growing." Uh, I have walked more miles than were on the maps that I used to study. Yeah. Which, like you said, like, I used to, or it took me like 20 years to get to where the desert started, I believe, right? Like, to get to... Something like that, yeah. Yeah, which is weird. I, obviously, time isn't our time, I don't believe, here either. And yeah, it's, kind it, of, it's hard to, like, trust Roland's... I don't know if Roland went from age 16... To age 36. I don't know that. Yeah. The age like that. You know, are we dealing with about a 50 year old man here? I, I don't yeah. know. I don't, I don't, I can't, I couldn't tell you. Roland in my mind is probably mid 40s. Yeah. This is about what I'd, I'd picture him as, but maybe late 30s too. I don't know. Idris isn't that old. Yeah. He played him pretty well too. Okay. Um, but then, you know, he said all these years he was moving away from John Farson, mm-hmm. who led the revolt, which toppled the world I grew up in. And then he says that, Farson wanted him dead because I stole something he held very dear. Mm-hmm. Um, and so Eddie's like, oh, well, what was that? What did yeah. you steal? And Roland's like, nope. 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 Not right now. Not right now. It's, that's not important to the story. Yeah. Um, but he's like, the point is that the world is wearing out around us. Uh, you know, it's, it's weakening. The beams are wearing down. And um, Eddie starts thinking about like this creepy old house from when he was, that he like, you know, was in his neighborhood when he was a child. It was like this old Victorian style manor. Mm-hmm. Um, something was weird about it. He, you know, kids talked about it was haunted. But he just, he got this feeling of like power and danger coming mm-hmm. from that house. And he's getting the same feeling coming from whatever the box is. Mm. Um, and so he starts to approach it. And like he starts like chanting or murmuring um, this saying that like is just coming into his head. Um, this is like this poem about like all the silent in the halls of dead. Yeah. And, um, it's, it's almost like he's out of it. Like he's just kind of in a trance almost. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so Roland pulls him back and he's like, Oh, Whoa. Hey buddy. Hey buddy. Calm down. Yeah. What the <laughs> fuck are you doing? <laughs> right. Um, so they, they head back to camp, but Eddie still feels a calling to him. Like mm-hmm. he's like, I need to go there. I missed this part of the book. Yeah. I, don't, I I must have skipped like five pages or something one time, just lost track. I knew this happened. 
I was like, is this a flashback? I forgot this fucking happened. So you're going to have to carry <laughs> me through this. I, I, this is all fresh. I have no notes for the next couple of pages. I don't know what happened. We're pretty close to the end. Yeah, um, yeah. But so Eddie's dreaming again. Um, he's heading back to the deli. Yeah. And uh, he sees himself in a mirror as he's like walking. Uh, and he notices like he's a lot tanner than he recognizes himself as. Mm-hmm. He's a lot more fit. Yeah. Um, and so he's like, I'm, I'm almost like a different, unrecognizable person. Yeah. Um, and he's only been here for, you know, six months, maybe, if that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, a lot of that on the beach, though, I think was a big time for him changing and morphing yeah. into who he needs, who he, who he became. Uh, How would you feel about the uh, paint it black being in his dream? The, you know the song about Rolling Stones? Yeah. Yeah. Um, With the red door, want to play, want to paint it black. I was like, okay, this is doors, obviously here. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't think a whole lot. Of, I didn't think a whole lot of it. Mm-hmm. Um, but now, I, now I kind of want to go listen to that and see if I can draw any clues from it. Well, the quote <laughs> that they say is, "I see a red door. I don't want to paint it black. No colors anymore. I want them to turn black. I see the girls walk by dressed in their summer clothes. I have to turn my head until my darkness goes. I don't know." Obviously, like, I never thought about the second two lines in that stanza as very important in the song. It's just like, you know, in this song, they say, I see a red door, what do you paint it black? I don't give a fuck about the rest of the chorus. It was badass in that song, yeah. you know? <laughs> so, including those two in there, I was kind of wondering what he was trying to get at. I don't know. King does it a lot. He'll just, like, uh, it starts off with, uh, I grew down in a dead man's town from, uh, oh, Born in the USA. Is it Born in the USA? Uh, I grew down in a dead man's town. I can't remember, honestly. I think it's born in the USA. Yeah. But yeah, it starts with that. So it all the the audio book readers read it just how I did with no like uh knowing of how the rhythm should go. <laughs> just read it like in the rate the straight uh meter, you know, as poetry would be, and it That's always hilarious. drove me fucking nuts. <laughs> I grew down in a dead man's town. <laughs> no, it's not how it goes, you sing it. <laughs> oh, that's that's awesome. Um but uh, Susanna wakes him up and she's like freaked out. Roland is curled up into like a fetal position. He's like muttering about other worlds and he's like screaming about Jake. Yeah. And um, like they kind of talk about like, oh, should we wake him up? And they notice like how close his gun is to him. Yeah. And they kind of get like, oh, if he goes insane, we're done for. Like we don't stand a chance yeah. defending ourselves. We are. Yikes. Yeah, he's becoming that, that rabid dog, you know, that like... He's becoming Cujo. <laughs> Think about Cujo. <laughs> oh, Cooge. He's a, he's a good boy. Um, but the next morning, you know, they eat and they head back to the to the box. Yep. And um, Roland just seems unaware of his nightmare. Like, he's like, oh, you know, hey. How do you do to campers? <sighs> How do you feel about Roland struggling with this so bad? Like, crying out for Jake in the night is such a turn. From the right. fucking Arnold Schwarzenegger Terminator that we got in the Gunslinger, you know? It's it's weird, for sure. It's so... He's not as cool anymore. <laughs> right. <laughs> Which, it's cool to like have your character go through something like this. But I'm like, the guy that shot Allie in the fucking forehead, wouldn't, he just wouldn't care. Yeah. You know, he wouldn't care. Maybe that was the desert, you know, hardening him. And now he's around water and people again. He's yeah. starting to get some of his humanity back. I think uh, he kind of might... Might have been able to do this better with having the Jake death maybe affect him more yeah. in the first book. Kind of rewrite that where it wasn't just a... It's like, I always pictured it, I don't know why I did it, but him like hanging onto him and like, and like oh, and then like Jake slips and grabs him. Roland just leaves the motherfucker. Yeah, he just kind of looks at him. He's like, oh, all yeah. right, doodles. Yeah, see ya. And Peace. It, yeah, I gotta go. So, yeah. catch you next time, boss. Um, <laughs> uh, but, yeah, he... Well, one thing that I think is really effective is that, like, throughout this whole section, The Bear and the Bone, um, we've really not had much of any uh, Roland point of view. Wow. Um, I didn't we, even think about that. We see him having, like, this mental breakdown and seeing how much it's torturing him from Eddie's perspective, yeah. from Suzanne's perspective. Huh. But whenever we do get little snippets of Roland, nothing about Jake. Like, it's just no. really small sections. And so I was like, I wonder, like... You know, it would be cool to kind of see like what's going on in his head, and like see how bad it's affecting him. But also, it's kind of powerful that like we don't like we don't know what's going on with them. They don't know what's going on with them. I think there could be a really cool, cool writing exercise there. Let me get my literature nerd on. Maybe having 
two of the exact same stories happening in two different columns on a page. Yeah. But like, it's just the little fact that Jake isn't there. And so like, if you want to read through it, you can, or you can just read, read through one. You're gonna get everything there. I've seen a, uh, something done like that it was a poem about two people, like a, uh, someone being sexually assaulted at work from the victim and the, uh, acute, the accused perspective. It was a, it was a cool thing. Like just two, two stories. I don't know. That'd have been really cool to see here. I think. Huh. That's interesting. That'd have been fun to just, if he's having one of those really bad times or maybe even, you could make it more unsettling than just having two columns on a page. Maybe something else could, uh, I don't know. I don't yeah. Know. Anybody has a good idea and they're big nerds like I am. want to see that shit done. <laughs> <laughs> Let me know. Put it in the comments. <laughs> um, before they take off though, he, um, or after they get to the box, like he kind of teaches them how to see the beam. Yeah. Um, and by to see the beam, you just basically have to zen out and like focus on nothing at, at once. Like you can't, let anything take your point of view like you yeah it's like those uh those pictures i don't i don't like know the my... puzzles where you have to like cross your eyes and like yeah you have to focus. not see what's in front of you You need to look through it and then you can make sense that <laughs> with your peripheries have you seen uh i think it's mall rats yeah <laughs> it's not a schooner dumbass it's a boat i don't remember that line at all oh there's like the, the guy who's like staring at the uh the one of those like magic pictures yeah and, like, throughout the whole movie like he's trying to figure it out <laughs> and uh like uh, someone like tells him like oh it's a boat yeah. and um, he's still trying to figure it out and like later a kid comes up and looks at him and goes oh it's a schooner it's like it's not a schooner dumbass it's a boat <laughs> all right yeah one of those things you gotta yeah. know what we're talking about so they uh they go to this they go back to the box so I thought it was just kind of like a door like maybe I don't know I never really pictured a box but that's yeah. that might be on me fucking up and uh. Roland has a makeshift cup that's patched up, which I, I don't know. A lot of detail in this cup for some reason. Yeah. But it was like made to have it cracked down the side, and then you had to patch it with gum, like from a tree. And I was like. Basically, he just does the thing where like he uh, fills up the cup with water and puts a little needle on it. So mm -hmm. it like makes a makeshift compass. Kind of, yeah. Um, and like he does that to point out which direction is north. Yeah. Um, but what, it does spend a lot of time talking about it. It ultimately didn't really feel all that important because like they followed the beam anyway yeah i think it was well i don't think he was looking for north i think that it was affected by the beam oh yeah that, that it was like goes. it wasn't necessarily a magnetic pull to go to true north that it was it was sitting in the bottom of this cup you know swirling around however you go into the beam then it like it straighten up it align then you go oh, out of the is. beam okay. and it, it'd start acting normal again that's why i feel like the beam has the effect on because they they have them like close their eyes and look at this like that picture and everything is kind of pointing the same way. Which, again, like the, they just notice patterns all around them, like yeah. leaves, the way the leaves are falling and pointing, and how the wind is moving. The shadows. I was like, "How the fuck does that mean?" Like I've noticed shadows are off. That would drive me fucking insane. Like, what the fuck? What? No, this is not right. <laughs> but uh, another really cool thing that can be done on screen. Could you imagine yeah. just having every pine pointing the same way or something like that? Just little things you could do with special effects. That would be a really cool thing to be seen on TV. Yeah, and um, so they're gonna start heading for or in the direction of the beam, mm -hmm. and Roland uh, stops Eddie, and he takes off his gun belt and gives it to him because mm -hmm. he realizes like, oh, I am not fit to be carrying this right now. Like yeah. I'm not mentally fit, and uh, Eddie is like just taken away because he knows like how big that is for Roland, yeah. um, and then, um. You know, he, he's kind of hesitant to even take it. And, you know, um, he makes a, like a wisecrack about the knife. <laughs> oh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> and uh, yeah, Roland, Roland's like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I and, forgot like, about that. <laughs> Eddie's just kind of getting exasperated. Like, he, cause, <laughs> yeah. like cause he doesn't believe it. And then um, Roland goes, oh, yeah, and there's there's one more thing also. Um, and he's like, what? What else are you? And he's like, just kidding. Just just fucking with him a little bit. Yeah, I, I like, like that he, aspect. He smiles. <laughs> Eddie's just like. What? Yeah. And Suzanne's in the background cracking up laughing. <laughs> That's some of my favorite stuff in, in books is like downtime chats, like where you just kind of get to see the characters in their environment. Yeah, like, they're not necessarily explaining the plot or what needs to happen next. They're just kind of being themselves. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I was actually unrelated to this, but like just thinking about that, I, was, I saw like a Twitter thread the other day and people are like, That's why. Uh, a lot of people like fan fiction so much because because like a lot of those like a lot of fan fictions are just downtime scenes not stuff happening but you just kind of get to see characters interact and 
sure who they are. Like, yeah, I saw you you had said something about like how plot was sometimes like the least interesting part of books. Yeah, so that that thread started with somebody being like, uh, "Can we admit that um, books don't have to be plot, have to have a plot to be good?" And I was like, "It's rough um, to I, make I, an." I, I kind of disagree, but <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave that there. I'll yeah. leave that there. Maybe um, a different time. I'll come back to yeah. that one. <laughs> but yeah, it's an interesting. It could be fun. Yeah. You know, if you really love these characters and you just want yeah. more of them, I'd, I'd take a, a book of them if I can go in the real world and eating at a diner like the Avengers do. Like, right. that'd be awesome. I'd, I'd, I'd watch the... And, and that scene from the Avengers is, like, honestly probably one of my favorite parts of the movie. It's yeah. just because, like, it's not action. It's not important, really. Mm-hmm. It's just them being like, whew, fuck, fuck. Man, that was rough. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Damn. Like, it, it was kind of put in there just for comedy, but, like, I don't know. I really liked it. it was yeah, just, it was nice. I do. I do get your point. I think. I, yeah. I don't know. I'll have to, we'll have to come back. To a that. whole book of that is hard to pull off, right? That'd be so. But, why do I care? You know, right? Like, where are we going? What What are we doing? You know, right? It's hard to. There's so many things that you need to follow in like writing a story, and I think that if you're not going to adhere to any rules, you have to. You either got people that love these characters, so the hard work's already been done. Yeah. Or you are just an amazing like joke teller. It's more of like a comedy, but I don't, I don't, I don't, yeah. I don't know what you, cause like even books about nothing, Seinfeld has a plot. It's a show yeah. about nothing. You know, you could have a, a, a plot about just normal everyday life or there has to be something that's happening. I, uh, there's this one book I read. I can't remember the name of it now, but, um, it's about like normal people in a world where like an epic fantasy is going on. Mm-hmm. Um, and so like the whole book, there's really not much of like a big plot other than like um, some drama in their lives. But like you see like heroes in the background or like you see news reports of like the big stuff going on. Yeah. And most of the book is just like these people kind of hanging out and like living in this world. I think that like divulging from like what is a really big plot point and more focusing on human interaction or yeah. human issues. I think could that, that would still serve in my idea as a plot though, that you yeah. would have something that I think that everybody wakes up every day with a, a sort of goal, a, something right. you need. If it means fucking feeding yourself, you know, to sustain your life, there is something that you need to do that day. Right. So as mundane as that may be, it'd be hard, right? Like, I think that works better for like shorter books or shorter sure. stories. I'm, I'm not reading yeah. 600 pages of no plot. There ain't right. a chance. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. So, um, but anyways, after after the he you know he gives them the knife and the gun, they uh, so they start walking, and Eddie sees this branch on a tree, yeah. um, and he kind of like calls out to him like like he he's like oh that would be good to whittle with, mm-hmm. but then like he gets that doubt he hears Henry's voice again. He's like, oh, I'll just leave it. It's, it's not important. I don't want to take the time. And uh, but Roland notices this, and he's like, I don't know what you're looking at, but go go grab it. Like, yeah, if something's important to you. It's probably important to us. Yeah. And uh, Eddie's still even kind of like, nah, it's it's, it's, it's silly. Mm-hmm. He's like, no, go do it, man. No, I'm telling you, go yeah. fucking do it. We're not moving until so. <laughs> <you> and, <know? laughs> uh, so he he goes and like takes the knife and like cuts this branch off the tree. Um, and he's like. I'm going to carve the key out of this. Yeah. And uh, so the chapter ends with, um, they skip forward to that night. It's like they're eating supper, sitting around the campfire. Um, Eddie's start, has started whittling it. Uh, we just see Susanna like kind of looking off at the stars. And then we finally get back into Roland's head for just a little bit. Just a little bit, right? And he's like, there was a boy. There was no boy. Was, wasn't, was. Yikes. Yeah. Maybe that's why we haven't been in his head this whole fucking right. time. Right. You know? <laughs> so that's where the chapter kind of ends off. Did you even see what happens on the next? Like, did you get any? It's like, oh, what's the next chapter going to be about? No, I didn't. Really? No shit? Yeah. First sentence. I'll let you read it. <laughs> For three weeks, John Jake Chambers fought bravely against the madness rising inside of him. So we're back to Jake. Fuck yeah. Okay, we're cool. Back in cool. his point Dope. of view. We get a little bit of a little bit of Jake here. And that's uh the big probably reveal of this book. You know, we yeah. kinda had it spoiled with us. But our next next week's episode is gonna be focused on Jake. So like we're in the real world. Yeah. We're with we're in New York. We got Jake, and he's going fucking insane too. And as much as 
we w- didn't have Roland in the first section, we don't. I don't think we leave Jake's perspective the next like 100, 150 pages. Damn. So we just kind of leave our quartet in Midworld, and we're back in New York for a while. Wow. Yeah. So it gets a little nuts. That's awesome. I, I definitely. Um. So you know, after the whole thing with Jack in the last book, I definitely didn't expect it to turn out like this. I kind of thought like, okay, so now Jake's okay, and he's gonna be back somehow. Mm-hmm. Um. I didn't expect it to like create a paradox really, or like fuck with their minds so much. Yeah. Um, and I'm really liking that. That's the direction you went with it. Yeah. It's kind of a weird take on the, the multiverse thing where it's yeah. like, Oh, you can somehow affect yourself and you know, everything that we've seen in, in most like time travel, uh, fiction that you're not the one affected. You know, Marty McFly starts to fade, but yeah. it's because of things that he did, you know, but he, he could go back in time and mess with Biff, but it didn't really necessarily affect him or his reality. As Doc explained, you know, there's branch realities and they had to bring it back to this one where Roland is in a body with a mind that lived two times. Kind of more like, you ever seen Butterfly Effect? Yeah, a long time ago. Okay, a long time ago. It's not a great movie, but it's a really fun little thing it, to it, do. Yeah. Did you ever see the sequels? I've heard they're absolutely terrible. They're so bad. Okay. <laughs> I've marathoned all the movies one day. How many are there? I think there's like three or four. Oh, no. You didn't need more than one. There's nowhere else to go. Yeah, I, I watched the first one, and then I like and then I marathoned the other ones a couple weeks later. Yeah. The, they're all unconnected, but... It's a cool concept. Yeah. But I only needed one. Yeah. I used to... I mean, I, when I say a movie isn't a great movie, I'm saying like it wasn't like Oscar worthy. I enjoyed the shit out of Butterfly Effect when I was yeah. a kid. You know, yeah. I, I love that movie, so... I don't want to like downplay that, but yeah. So like maybe he's having you know two two lives, and it's only a section of time that might have been a couple months, you know, traveling yeah. in the desert with Jake, but it's fucking him up, and now it's fucking Jake up. But I couldn't imagine. I'm dead. No, I'm not. I'm here. I'm alive. No, I'm dead. I died. I remember dying. Yeah, <laughs> I died. I'm, I'm 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 I don't exist anymore. No, I'm here. I could pitch myself. I'm still alive. You know. So it's gonna be a. Uh, I really I do like this next section with Jake because it's a uh, it's batshit insane. You know what? The next section is titled "The Key and the Rose." Which were big things to Eddie, but I wonder how they'll play out to Jake. Yeah, we'll leave it right there because that's a it's a fun talking point. We'll we'll get to next time. Yeah, we'll probably try to get the next hundred or so pages. And uh, so yeah, you got anything you wanted to top it off with before we got out of here? Um, no, I'm just especially now that like I know that it's not gonna follow you know Roland and Pals, um, Roko. Um, <laughs> the Roco. <laughs> um, I uh, I don't have like any predictions or anything. Like I'm just excited to see you know what's going on with Jake. Hell yeah, still enjoying it though. Having oh, absolutely, reading. awesome. Hell yeah. Well, I'm having a great time doing this and getting through one of my favorite books. Ser- probably my favorite book series. I don't know if we got to my favorite book yet, but it's coming. Right on. <laughs> Thank y'all for joining us. This has been a, a great time. I really do enjoy this book. I'm happy we're kind of flying through the first two where we can start to learn and talk about things you know i can't talk so much about a prelude it's just like oh this is crazy right like yeah, yeah this is cool huh but we're getting into the we're getting some more information some more exposition here and i love it and y'all stopping by you made it through this like subscribe rate us on apple Podcasts or spotify and uh, join the discord yeah join discord I actually like put like two things in the spoiler section today because i oh, read something I was like, oh shit i know what's going on here and <laughs> there's <laughs> something happening so uh yeah i can't uh I'd love to interact with you guys, whether it be commenting underneath this video uh, by by rating us. I'll try to read those. I don't know how to find them. But if you want to uh, directly contact me, just get in Discord. Like Jake said, we're trying to figure that out. I posted a fun sci-fi what if in there. So, like, go check that out. Oh, shit. When did you post? Did I miss that? I I think I put it in the general um, a couple days ago. Yeah, I'm going to have to check that out. I'm really bad at Discord. I'm not going to lie. Go in there. See what's up. Join the conversation. Start the conversation. I love that. Yeah. Join Discord. Join the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, till next time, I'm redacted or Larmer. I don't know if I ever or introduced myself. This is my co-host Jake. Oh yeah, hi. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Nice so that's you. our that's our names. <laughs> we'll uh, catch you next time. Thanks for stopping by. Doodles. By the way, what does redacted mean?